Chapter Twenty Five of Trails End by George W. Ogden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A summons at sunrise. Three horses were standing in Stillwell's yard, bridle reins on the ground, as three horses had stood on the morning that Morgan first found his tortured way to that hospitable door. In the house, the Stillwell family and Morgan were at breakfast, attended by Violet who bore on biscuits and ham to go with the coffee that sent its cheer out through the open door, as if to find a traveler and lead him to refreshment. Behind the cottonwoods along the river, sunrise was about to break. "'I'm getting so I can't wake up of a morning when I sleep in a house,' Stillwell complained, his broad face radiating humor. "'I guess I'll have to take the blankets again, old lady.' "'I guess you can afford to sleep till half-past three in the morning once in a while,' Mrs. Stilwell said complacently. "'Why, Morgan, that man didn't sleep under a roof once in a month the first five or six years we were on this range. He just laid out like a coyote anywhere night overtook him, watching them cattle like they were children. Now what's come of it?' This last bitter note, ranging back to the recent loss from Texas fever, took the cheer out of Stilwell's face. A brooding cloud came over it. His merry chafe was stilled. Yes, and Drummond will pay for the eight hundred head of stock he killed for us, if I have to trail him to his hole in Texas, Fred declared. Suit or no suit, that man's going to pay. I don't like to hear you talk that way, honey, his mother chided. Suit, Fred scoffed. What does that man care about a suit? He'll never show his head in this country any more. The next drive he makes, he'll load west of here, and we'll never know anything about it. There's just one way to fix a man like him, and I know the recipe that'll cure his hide. If he ever drives another head of stock into this state, I'll hear of it, and I'll attach him. It'll be four or five years before the railroad's built down into that country. He'll have to drive here or nowheres. I'll set right here on this range till he comes. Did the rain strike any of your range? Morgan inquired, eager to turn them away from this gloomy matter of loss and revenge. Yes, we got a good soaking over the biggest part of it. Plenty of water now, grass jumping up like spring. It's the prettiest country, cow, a man ever set eyes on after a rain. And in the spring, said Mrs. Stilwell, wistfully. And when the wild roses bloom in May, said Violet. There's no place in the world as pretty as this country, then. I believe you, Morgan told them, nodding his head in undivided assent. Even dry as it is around Ascalon, and that country north, it gets hold of a man. You buy along on that river here somewhere, Cal, and put in a nice little herd. It won't take you long to make a start and a good start. This country ain't begun to see the cattle it will. Somebody's coming, said Violet running to the door to see, a plate of hot biscuits in her hand. "'Seems to be in a hurry for this early in the day,' Stilwell commented, listening to the approach of a galloping horse. He was not much interested. Horsemen came and went past that door at all hours of the day and night, generally in a gallop. "'It's Rita,' Violet announced from the door, turning hurriedly to put the plate of biscuits on the table, where it stood before unheeding eyes. "'Rita?' Mrs. Stilwell repeated, getting up in excitement. I wonder what? Rita was at the door, the dust of her arrival making her indistinct to those who hurried from the unfinished breakfast to learn the cause of this precipitous visit. Morgan saw her leaning from the saddle, her loosely confined hair half falling down. Is Mr. Morgan here? she inquired. The girl's voice trembled. Her breath came so hard. Morgan could hear its suspiration where he stood. It was evident that she labored under a tremendous strain of anxiety, arising out of a trouble that Morgan was at no loss to understand. Yet he remained in the background, as Stilwell and Fred crowded to the door. "'Why, Reedy, what's happened?' Stilwell inquired, hurrying out, followed by his wife and son. Violet was already beside her perturbed visitor, looking up into her terror-blanched face. Oh, they've come, they've come, Rita gasped. Who, Stilwell asked, mystified, laying hold of her bridle, shaking it, as if to set her senses right. Who's come, Rita? 
I came for Mr. Morgan, she panted, as weak, it seemed, as a wounded bird. I thought he came here. He had your horse. He's here, honey, Mrs. Stillwell told her, consoling her like a hurt child. Morgan did not come forward. He stood as he had risen from his chair at the table, one hand on the cloth, his head bent as if in a travail of deepest thought. The shaft of tender new sunlight, reaching in through the open door, struck his shoulders and breast, leaving his face in the shadow that well suited the mood darkening over his soul like a storm. A thousand thoughts rose up and swirled within him, a thousand harsh charges, a thousand seeds of bitterness. Rita, leaning to peer under the lintel of the low door, could see him there, and she reached out her hand, appealing without a word. He is here, honey, Mrs. Stilwell repeated, assuringly, comfortingly. Tell him, tell him Craddock's come, Rita said. Craddock said Stilwell, pronouncing the name with the inflection of surprise. Oh, I thought something awful had happened to somebody. He turned with the ease of indifference in his manner to go back and finish his meal. Well, didn't you look for him to come back? I knew all the time he'd come. Morgan lifted his head. The sun broken by Rita's shadow, brightened on the floor at his feet, and spread its beam upon his breast like a golden stole. The old wound on his cheekbone was a scar now, irregular, broad from the crude surgery that had bound it but illy. Its dark disfigurement increased the somber gravity of his face, sunburned and wind-hardened as any rangers who rode that prairie waste. From where he stood, Morgan could not see the girl's face, only her restless hand on the bridle range, the brown of her riding skirt, the beginning of white at her waist. There ought to be men enough in Ascalon to take care of Craddock, Violet said. He's not alone. Some of those Texas cowboys are with him, Rita explained, her voice firmer, her words quicker. Mr. Morgan is still marshal. He gave me his badge, but please tell him I didn't. I forgot to turn it in with his resignation. I don't see that it's Cal's fight this time, Reedy, Stilwell said. He's done enough for them yellow pups over in Ascalon to be yelped at and cussed for saving their dirty hides. They're looking for him. They think he's hiding. Well, let him look. If they come over here, they'll find him. Cal ain't making no secret of where he's at, and they will find somebody standing back to back with him any time they want to come. Stilwell's resentment of Ascalon's ingratitude toward his friend was plainer in his mouth than print. They're going to burn the town to drive him out, Rita said, gasping in the terror that shook her heart. I guess it'll be big enough to hold all the people that's in it when they're through, said Stilwell, unfeelingly. Here's his badge, said Rita, offering it frantically. Tell him he's still marshal. Yes, you come for him now, said Violet accusingly. I told you. You remember now what I told you. Oh, Violet, oh, Violet, if you knew what I've paid for that, if you knew. Not as much as you owe him, if it was the last drop of blood in your heart, said Violet, and she turned away and went and stood by the door. They'll burn the town, Rita moaned. Oh, isn't anybody going to help me? Won't you call him, Violet? No, said Violet, he can hear you. He'll come if he wants to, if he's fool enough to do it again. Violet, her mother cautioned. How many are with him? Fred inquired. Seven or eight. I didn't see them all. Pa's collecting a posse to guard the bank. They're going to rob it. They're welcome to all I've got in it, Stilwell said. You'd better come in and have a cup of coffee, Reedy, before. The one they call the Dutchman's there, and Drum. Drum? Fred and his father spoke like a chorus, both of them jumping to alertness and some others of that gang Mr. Morgan drove out of town. They were setting the hotel afire when I left. Stilwell did not wait for all of it. He was in the house at a jump, reaching down his guns, which hung beside the door. Close after him, Fred came rushing in, snatching his weapons from the buffalo horns on the wall. I'm going to get service on that man, Stilwell said. Are you going with us, Cal? But Cal Morgan did not reply. He went to the bedroom where he had slept, took up his gun, stood looking at it a moment, as if considering something, snatched his hat from the bedpost and turned back, buckling his belt. Mrs. Stilwell and Violet 
were struggling with husband and brother to restrain them from rushing off to this battle, raising a turmoil of pleading and protesting at the door. As Morgan passed Stilwell, who was greatly impeded in his efforts to buckle on his guns by his wife's clinging arms and passionate pleadings to remain at home, Fred broke away from his sister and ran for the kitchen door. Let Drum go. Let all of them go. Let the cattle go. Let everything go. None of it's worth risking your life for. Stillwell's affectionate good wife pleaded with him. Now, mother, I'm not going to get killed, Morgan heard Stillwell say, his very assurance calming. But the poor woman, who perhaps had recollections of past battles and perils which he had gone through, burst out again, weeping, and clung to him as if she could not let him go. Morgan paused a moment at the threshold, as if reconsidering something. Violet, who had stood leaning her head on her bent arm, weeping, that Fred was rushing to throw his life away, lifted her tearful face, reached out and touched his arm. "'Must you go?' she asked. For reply, Morgan put out his hand as if to say farewell. She took it, pressed it a moment to her breast, and ran away, choked on the grief she could not utter. Morgan stepped out into the sun. Rita Thayer stood at the door, a little aside, as if waiting for him, as if knowing he would come. She was agitated by the anxious hope that spoke out of her white face, but restrained by a fear that could not hide in her wide, straining eyes. She moved almost imperceptibly toward him. Her lips parted as if to speak, but said nothing. As Morgan lifted his hand to his hat in grave salute, passing on she offered him the badge of his office which she had held gripped in her hand he took it inclining his head as if in acknowledgment of its safe keeping through the night and hastened on to one of the horses that stood dozing on three legs in the early sun as he left her rita followed a few quick steps a cry rising in her heart for him to stay a moment to spare her one word of forgiveness out of his grim, sealed lips. But the cry faltered away to a great, stifling sob, while tears rose hot in her eyes, making him dim in her sight as he threw the reins over the horse's head, starting the animal out of its sleep with a little squatting jump. She stood so, stretching out her hands to him, while he, unbending in his stern answer to the challenge of duty, unseen in the hard bitterness of his heart, swung into the saddle and rode away. Rita groped for her saddle, blind in her tears. Morgan was hidden by the dust that hung in the quiet morning behind him as she mounted and followed. Half a mile or so along the road, Fred passed her, bending low as he rode, as if his desire left the saddle and carried him ahead of his horse. A little while, and Stillwell thundered by, leaving her last and alone on that road leading to what adventures her heart shrunk in her bosom to contemplate. Ahead of her, the smoke of Ascalon's destruction rose high. End of chapter 25